Hello, beautiful, lovely, wonderful you. Hello. Uh, today we start our new topic, the 2021 national topic for the summertime. And as with all topics, there are always things I would rather talk about. Uh, but I am happy that uh, in contrast to, let's say, the IMF or the Persian Gulf, this one is actually directly relevant to all of our lives, at least to mine. Uh, the video might be a little bit long. Uh, as usual, it will be as long as it has to be, no longer. I will be adding some rebuttals and disadvantages to each argument I talk about. So pause the video uh, before the rebuttals to try to think of some by yourself if you want some extra practice during the video. And then for extra, extra practice, try to come up with some front lines to answer the rebuttals that I give you. Uh, the rebuttals list, as with everything in this video, is not exhaustive, uh, but will give you some ideas of how to start thinking about this topic. A couple other things. Uh, as always, these are only the major arguments that I thought of, right? So I did think of some other ones uh, and find some other ones. Uh, for this, go to the brief at debatetrack.com, uh, but also do your own research, right? And do some brainstorming with your teammates and your coach and your friends, and you'll come up with probably some other more original ideas. In particular, I think there's a lot of potential in some interesting arguments about particular apps like TikTok or Reddit or my current fascination, Clubhouse. Second, none of these thoughts or evidence are full contentions. All of this is only a starting point. Uh, so take your time to assemble logical arguments and find the right evidence to make them work. Uh, the brief that I provide in this video is only, like I say, a starting point. Uh, lastly, like and subscribe. Uh, your uh, favorite social media app, comment it below what you like the most. And if it's Instagram or TikTok, comment your username and I will follow you. I feel like this is most appropriate for the uh, social media topic. All right, let us uh, begin the lecture, shall we? So here's the topic itself. In the United States, social media is beneficial for democratic values. Uh, so first, we're going to look at some definitions, talk a little bit about topicality and uniqueness, and then go on to the actual arguments. And for today, the rebuttals as well. So I think for this topic, topicality and uniqueness will play a very large role. And that's sort of by nature of the resolution itself. Uh, and let's say of, of the topic, as we'll look at uh, soon. So I put the word tricks here as kind of a joke. I don't actually think it's inappropriate to talk about topicality or uniqueness, and I think you have to be very prepared for both of them, because even if you're not trying to debate at that level, obviously that's not the most fun or engaging or useful place to debate. I think other people will, because I think it will be a good strategy to win, uh, to attack people on topicality and uniqueness. So you should have a firm grasp of these um, as they relate to your contentions and your case before uh, going into a tournament. So social media definitions, I think we all have pretty good intuition of what social media is, but it helps to define it. Uh, obviously, it's electronic communication. That I could have admitted. Uh, some important aspects of it, though. Uh, social media forms networks. Uh, networks are formed of individual nodes or people on the networks. And it also forms uh, communities. Right? So community is around some topic, area, some interest, something about geography or habits. And so these two things, networks and communities, are important. Uh, so you can imagine a blog, right? A, a sort of one-way communication. There could be, uh, or, or a podcast, there could be communities that form around those experiences, like uh, fans of the Joe Rogan experience, for example. Uh, but it doesn't really form a network, right? Because uh, the nodes are not connected to each other, right? Uh, and likewise, there could be, um, for example, chatting apps like, like Telegram or Facebook Messenger. They form networks of people, but they don't really form communities um, around certain things, although they, they could, they're mostly emphasizing one-on-one uh, -on -one communication and, and small groups. Uh, second, the information that, that you share on social media, obviously it has to share some kind of social information, uh, but it can be in any kind of a medium. So uh, usually text, image, or video, although there's no reason to limit it to those things. So this is social media, the, 
What's a little bit more difficult to define is democratic values, the second piece of this resolution. And so I've included in the brief a couple cards that give some kind of definition, but I have to admit, none of them are great. And in fact, I, I couldn't find anything in my brief search that was a, a really authoritative definition of democratic values. So this is the battlefield on which um, the topicality debate will be fought. What is and what is not a democratic value? So I've listed these things, these suggestions, uh, uh, an incomplete list uh, in order, I believe, from the most and uh, to the least topical. So if you want to start by talking about democratic values, the most obvious thing is, is democracy, right? Democracy must be the ultimate form of a democratic value. And what is democracy? Well, it's essentially voting, right? So if you have an argument that links to voting, I think this would be the way to gain, let's say, complete topicality. Um, if, it, if it helps more people to vote or if it makes the quality of voting uh, higher or, or reduces the quality of voting, this will be directly topical. Uh, but almost equally uh, important is civic participation. So this is a big part of democracy, not just voting in uh, elections, but participating in society in such a way that you, you aim to improve your society, especially you can think on a local level if you join a, a school board or a community organization, uh, if you do any kind of volunteering in your community, this is all civic participation. You're, you're trying to make your community better in some way. Um, uh, rule of law is uh, another one. Uh, there's a lot of things that could link into rule of law. And you can imagine that in, uh, let's say, more authoritarian countries, uh, China, Russia, uh, the rule of law wouldn't apply to everyone equally. So you can imagine people in power or, um, you know, leaders especially, the rule of law would apply less. Um, in America, there's certainly differential application of the law. That is certainly the case. But you can say that we, we strive for a society or we would value a society where law rather than like power or money uh, was what uh, actually ruled society. Next, truth and information. Once again, a lot of ties between truth and information to social media, uh, both for good and for bad, but um, we, we're getting a little bit farther from topicality now. So can you really say truth and information is a democratic value? Well, you can make the case. So how can you make the case? Well, it's very difficult to think about voting, uh, especially in an appropriate or uh, a useful way if you don't have adequate information. Excuse me, I'm taking off my coat. Okay, so imagine you want to vote for a teacher, right? I'm, I'm gonna give you a new teacher and I'm gonna have you vote for one. And, and here's your three choices, right? You can choose uh, either A or you can choose B or you can choose C. And that's all the information you have, right? So I've given you a situation where yes, you can vote technically, but you don't have information about the people. Right. Uh, so you wouldn't really consider this to be voting, actually. Right. You, you it's kind of a random thing. And, and, and so you you need uh, information, good information in order to vote well. And that applies. Of course, we typically think about the presidential voting, but really for all voting. Right. For all voting at any level, this applies. Civic participation, the same thing. You need uh, actually information and ideally true information. Um, so if you are out in society and trying to change it, but you're, you have wrong or untrue information about it, then you might be trying to change it for the worse. So if you're trying to prevent um, people from wearing masks because you believe that there are chips in it and they're taking away from our freedom or our rights, that could be actually a kind of civic participation, but a very negative uh, version of it if your uh, information is based on falsehoods. Uh, likewise in voting, so instead of saying that there's teachers A, B, and C to choose from. Let's say I instead say teacher A is a known arson and teacher B uh, loves to throw books at her students and uh, uh, teacher C refuses to wear shoes anywhere he goes. Um, okay, and let's say that they're wonderful teachers and none of these things are actually true, right? So now I've provided you with lies, with untrue information, right? And that, that could make your job even harder, maybe even worse than random if you get bad information. So the same thing applies to voting and to civic participation. Uh, life, liberty, and the pr pursuit of happiness. This is like a very, very famous um, phrase that we we think about when we really think about like the essential rights of being American. 
Um, I'd like to focus essentially, especially on liberty. So like kind of the ideal libertarian view is that you should be able to do whatever you want. You should have maximum freedom as long as that freedom doesn't tread on the freedoms of other people, right? Um, uh, I, I don't think that the majority of Americans are libertarian, but this is a, sort of an extreme um, an extreme idea about libertarianism that you could, could embrace uh, just in terms of like we should maximize freedom and freedom is a, a democratic value in the U.S. Uh, lastly, the Bill of Rights. So the first 10 amendments to the Constitution constitute the Bill of Rights added shortly after the Constitution was written. These include things like the right to free speech, the freedom of uh, assembly, freedom of religion, state rights, things like that. And uh, I think most people would get behind the idea that if you are promoting freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of uh, assembly, uh, as social media does, uh, just gives you kind of more outlets to practice that, or if you're limiting it, right, by through censorship or something like this, uh, that this would be related to democratic values. But it's not very clear that it relates to democratic values. Uh, certainly not just because it's in the Constitution, because that's not what the resolution says. It says democratic values. It doesn't say constitutional values um, or anything like that. For example, in the Bill of Rights, we also have the Second Amendment, which is about um, guns, right? The right to bear arms. So uh, is this something that you're going to defend if you're also defending the right to free speech? Um, this is something to think about. So social media defined, democratic values defined. Let's talk briefly about topicality. We've already talked about, let's say, some non-topical examples of social media, things like Telegram, WeChat Messenger, that are really um, primarily chat apps, right? So there's a, a large number of um, online electronic media that don't count as social media. Uh, also democratic values. So tons of things that are good about social media. You know, they're very entertaining. It helps with companies, helps with branding and commerce. Uh, tons of bad things about social media. Uh, it can cause addiction, mental health issues. Um, but these things are not related to democratic values. So uh, keep this in mind. Lots of pros and cons about social media that are not about democratic values. And this is something you're going to want to call your opponents out on uh, anytime you see it. Uh, last, uniqueness. And so this is another uh, major battleground alongside topicality. Well, once we've established things like voting, civic participation are almost certainly within the realms of the resolution, uh, then we have to start thinking about uniqueness. So there was already social change, civic participation, fake news, propaganda, polarization, all of these major arguments for this topic, they existed before social media. So you have to ask for your own arguments and for your opponent's arguments, is this the result of social media? Or is this just a result of society, something that happens naturally, a part of being in a society, part of being American even? Um, social change, for example, right? Uh, uh, black Americans were freed from slavery, at least in part, it started, right, 150 years ago, far before social media, right? Same thing um, with uh, women's suffrage, them getting the, the right to vote, uh, with uh, child labor laws and general labor laws. Um, civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s. Um, MLK was not a TikTok dancer, right? We've had many, many, many major changes to society, um, to civil life without social media. So if we have more changes now, is that just because society changes or is that because of social media? Um, the next part to kind of tease apart is social media versus smartphones and the internet. And so there's a lot of things that the internet and that smartphones uh, result in that um, are very interesting, but it's not necessarily the fault of social media or the responsibility of social media. So for example, I might take uh, pictures. This is not a democratic value, but I would say people take way more pictures now than, you know, 20 years ago. Um, now is that because, did smartphones make people take pictures? Of course, people took pictures before smartphones. Okay, of course they did. Uh, but people undeniably take m many more pictures now. Um, is that because of social media? Well, you could argue, no, it's smartphones or people have cameras in their pocket, right? Uh, if you have camera in your pocket, you're going to take a lot more pictures. Um, but probably uh, most of those pictures or a lot of those pictures are for social media, right? So social media kind of drives um, a lot of behavior and uh, especially amplifies it. So if people uh, were able to get polarized before, perhaps social media helps uh, to speed up that process of polarization. Okay, let us move on to the actual arguments for pro. So I'm going to start with a quote from Cass Sunstein, American legal scholar, that 
If I was in the business of writing cases, I might start my AF case with. On balance, the question of whether social media platforms are good for democracy is easy. On balance, they are not merely good. They are terrific. Kat Sunstein. Uh, so these four bubbles are four general topic areas that I've grouped arguments together under. Uh, once again, it's not exhaustive. In fact, uh, in, in the brief itself, there's some other minor arguments, but these, I think, are most of the major points. Uh, reasons why social media benefits democracy, democratic values in America. The first is activism. So activism includes civic engagement, which we talked about before. Uh, our evidence points to the fact that especially black and Hispanic Americans, uh, based on polling data, rely on social media for civic engagement. Um, civic engagement also in, uh, results in social change that's unique to social media. Um, this, these hashtags, BLM, Me Too, MAGA, they were all uh, started online and all sort of pointed to real life things that um, groups of people wanted, wanted and still want to change. Um, and specifically, uh, social media can help to uh, organize groups of people around common interests, uh, around common uh, interest to change things in society, and also can help to organize protests, which is a pretty big uh, mover of, of, of uh, civic change. Um, so activism, I think this is probably one of the most solid arguments for uh, the pro side. Let's think about um, rebuttals. Go ahead and pause the video, otherwise let's take a look. Uh, not complete, but uh, here's my thoughts. So non-unique, we'll start with this. We're going to non-unique almost all of these arguments um, because because nothing is, social media does very, very things that are 100% unique. Um, and so my point here um, about the uniqueness of social activism is what I've already said. We've gone through many, many, many changes in society without the use of social media. Um, second, or first on this list, no impact. So hashtag activism is not the same as uh, actually changing things in society. In fact, you could turn this argument, although I don't have evidence to support this, I suspect it might be true, that because uh, it's too easy to express your view online, it, you could actually sort of get your itch out, right? Without actually changing something in society. Let's say that you're angry about some kind of injustice. Perhaps before social media, you would have to go and talk to people. You might go to a, a, a board meeting somewhere, a, a community meeting. Uh, you, you could just make a sign a petition, maybe try to make something actually change, right? Uh, whereas online, you might just fire off a tweet and then that's it, right? That's, that's how much you've changed, right? Change your profile picture on Instagram or something, and that's your activism, right? How much does it actually impact the real world? Uh, we can call this into question. Um, then a threshold DA. So I, I haven't written up this DA, and I don't have any evidence about it, but I, I think it um, I think it's a very solid DA you can apply to um, this, th the most strong sort of general argument on the pro side. And if you're seriously competing in PF, I would recommend preparing some kind of a disadvantage like this. Um, which is just because it is too easy to uh, express your rage or opinion over any kind of an issue, there are uh, small matters that are blo blown uh, wholly out of proportion, right? Especially with the network effects of social media, the polarizing effects of social media. This will link into um, foreign influence and to the psychological effects of social media that, that people get really, really angry about uh, uh, on social media. And there are small things that can be blown up. Um, so the go-to example of this would be the Me Too movement, right? Which was a, a movement that is still um, underway, but for, from some years ago, that was um, a woman protesting, like disgusting, especially like sexual abuse or, or harassment from men, right? And um, many men were rightly uh, called out, um, you know, some really egregious examples of, of horrible things that men have done and gotten away with, right, for too long. Um, and also just the general thing of like, you know, men should stop being gross to women. Okay. And, and so mo most of this was very, very good. Uh, but there were um, some borderline examples where people suffered the same consequences as people who had done truly horrific things, right? They, I mean, they suffered public shame, public humiliation, um, being fired from jobs, being fired from, I mean, end ending careers, right? Um, for relatively minor offenses. I mean, what, what might amount to uh, misunderstandings potentially or... Um, 
you know, a bad date, right? Something probably they, they regret, something that's probably bad, but um, there's certainly like um, levels, right, to um, to inappropriate behavior. And, the, and social media puts the threshold to extreme action at next to nothing, right? Like if someone makes a minor mistake, they can uh, lose their job and their reputation, right? And this is this is sort of the power of social media, right? This is something that we're going to see throughout um, throughout this topic that social media is just extremely powerful, right? And for good and for bad, right? And sometimes uh, that difference can be a little bit blurry. All right, so that's on activism. Like I said, probably the most strong argument from the pro side overall. Uh, next is information. And so in, uh, uh, social media is a big news source for a lot of people. Um, people who use social media will see a lot more news than other people, right? Uh, but it also helps just to share, to share, yeah, information, but also to share grievances. So if you have any issues um, in your life, especially issues of um, oppression or repression or g g general society or personal issues, issues about mental health or finances or education or, you know, in the, in the worst case, like extreme injustice, right? Like police or other people, abuse from other people, right? Social media is one area where people can get help and reach out and organize and, and, and share information about things. So social media kind of amplifies everyone's voice in a way where like individuals can uh, be heard, right? Uh, you, you, you can sort of poke your head out of the huddled masses uh, when you need to, sometimes on social media, right? All right, thinking about rebuttals for news and information. Uh, by the way, uh, we've already said that news and information uh, ties into voting as well and civic participation. Uh, so that would be, yeah, another potential link. All right, here's some potential rebuttals. So as with everything, we're non-uniquing it, right? Um, uh, news can get you you can get news from everywhere uh, and in fact you can also uh, potentially turn this as well because of because of fake news right so it's like it's actually bad that people are getting information on social media because so much of that information is false it's just not true um, and you can look at the alternative if there was no social media and you wanted to go get news you might go to you know BBC CNN Al Jazeera even Fox right you might go to Google, uh, Google News right and any of these sites um, these are professional news organizations, right? And so they have expert journalists, uh, they have professional staff, they have people who, you know, have gone to school for this job versus, you know, I mean, a, a, a Russian troll or, I mean, and any of you, any of you, if you spent it, if you close this video and spent an hour working on it, could make a website that looks like a news website, make up some f fake credentials and start making fake news articles like that's very easy and accessible for everyone to do right and uh, that's what a lot of you know social media news is so yeah it's actually a bad thing that would be the general rebuttal okay uh voter turnout uh, once again this is a really good argument because it's it's just 100 percent topical right if you can show that uh the quality or quantity of vo voting is increased by social media, then that's uh, that's a real solid contention. The it, the magnitude might not be gigantic, but it's um, it's hard to beat back that argument. It's pretty. It's just simple and elegant and topical. Um, so there was a Facebook study quoted in the evidence, I believe from 2012, where Facebook shows a banner across the top of the screen to all of the Facebook users in in America. And uh, they, there was a study done, I believe, in science that showed that the, the banner had an effect, right, to the tune of several hundred thousand votes, which is, you know, a couple percent, right, um, of the voting populace, which is huge, right? If you can boost voting by 2%, 3% through, like, a very simple intervention, that's incredible. That is, that is huge power. Um, and this study was just from Facebook. I, I think there, uh, Twitter may also be mentioned. I'm not sure how it relates. Um, but even even the social networks, um, uh, direct actions like these banners aside, you can imagine on voting day, you log into any platform, you know, TikTok, LinkedIn, anything, you're going to see people making posts about voting, right? And so that could remind you to vote or could encourage you to vote. Um, I think very few of you watching are able to vote, but you get the idea. All right, rebuttals. How can we rebut this? Boop, boop, boop. All right, so we're going to look at one of the big arguments um, later on in the con section, which is foreign interference. Uh, most of you being debaters know that Russia has 
uh, interfered in U.S. elections through social media. Uh, f- fascinating, fascinating operations. And um, you could say it outweighs. So, uh, yes, social media may make a few more Americans vote, but the quality of their voting is going to be severely degraded by uh, fake news. Here we go, the fake news DA, right? Like the quality of voting goes down, uh, plus foreign interference, right? Which is like the worst, right? It's like literally our enemies are choosing our leaders. Instead of us choosing our leaders, it's our enemies. Um, And then there's also uh, voting skepticism, which came out uh, in a big way in the last election, right? Um, That... uh, uh, Trump and the Republican Party, and I uh, gather other people as well, sort of spread the idea that the election was going to be stolen uh, by the Democratic val- uh, Party, and this made a lot of Republicans uh, not want to vote, right? Or they say, you know, why why should you vote, essentially, if your vote doesn't count, right? If it's just going to be stolen by a corrupt system, why bother, right? And so uh, spreading this message on through social media, um, in some contexts, I believe, reduced voting. Certainly not all, but in in some. Um, I should say as an aside that uh, voter turnout has been steadily rising. And in the last election, we saw the highest voter turnout in decades. And you, um, that could be in part because of polarization. People just feel feel very strongly about politics. Um, But if you're running this argument, I would definitely credit social media with that trend. Uh, All right, the last argument for the F side is uh, very interesting, I think, but uh, not that solid. This is kind of a half-formed idea in my mind, and it's a... a, a, The the magnitude is big enough that I I thought I should put it in here, but uh, the logic is shaky at best. So we have a card uh, from a former U.S. Admiral current physician um, talking about social media as a naval naval tool to be used for reconnaissance to find out uh, what our enemy's locations and intent. So take a submarine, for example, right? Submarines, their, their whole mission relies on stealth and secrecy, right? And so if you know where the submarine is, it's essentially no longer a threat. And, and the reason it is a threat is because you never know where it is, right? Um, so uh, if social media can help to give away the locations of things like this, um, it could be a very powerful military tool, right? There have been cases where uh, the U.S. military in other contexts, non-naval contexts, has caught bad guys uh, because they, you know, posted a selfie to Facebook or something. Um, uh, Another big part mentioned in the card is sowing fear in your enemy and disinformation uh, campaigns. uh, Essentially, uh, in terms of fear, like if if you know, if you're sitting in your house in peace at home and, and you know that the... U.S. Marines are coming to take your city, you're probably not going to be happy about that, right? And with good reason. Uh, and so the impact, this is how we would how we would um, link it in, is, is that the U.S. military helps to spread and maintain democracy around the world. Uh, and this is true. I mean, the U.S. is essentially uh, not the world's strongest democracy. Um, far from it. It's certainly not a pure, the, the, the functioning of the U.S. itself is far from a pure democracy, but it, it's certainly the biggest advocate, the biggest a- international advocate of democracy. Um, y- you can argue whether it works or not. Maybe the U.S. actually harms the spread of democracy. Uh, that could be the case. But the U.S. does work to spread democracy. So I think there's something to this argument, and there's uh, something to this. It would be a very large magnitude um, if you could... If you could pull it off. Uh, Some potential rebuttals is there's no impact versus like, so yeah, you could say like, yes, the U.S. military is very strong. Yeah, fine. It's very strong. Uh, But it's strong because of other things. Like you you cannot seriously imagine that Instagram is helping you win wars. Like, uh, you know, high levels of training, incredible systems, military tech. These are the things that are winning wars, uh, not Instagram, you know. Um, you can also say that um, intervention is bad. We shouldn't be intervening for many, many, many reasons. It doesn't matter if it spreads democracy. It doesn't matter if it helps democracy at home. It doesn't matter if it pushes back the uh, encroaching threat of uh, authoritarianism. Like, we should not be intervening in other countries militarily. Uh, yeah, so uh, some rebuttals against this. But once again, the argument itself is not that solid as presented. So just a thought. Let's go to Khan, shall we?
So I start once again with the first quote of my hypothetical case that I'll never write on this topic. Social networks such as Twitter, Facebook, and Google hold the potential to alter civil engagement, thus essentially hijacking democracy by influencing individuals toward a particular way of thinking. These are some from some professors. Once again, four arguments. Once again, the last one is the least well thought out, but a hot, probably highest magnitude and both uh, and also important. Uh, but let's start with foreign interference. So this is essentially the uh, other side of the coin in terms of voting. So um, Russia had a big uh, operation of people they would hire, some Russian people, and they would uh, make accounts, particularly on Facebook, uh, that were um, uh, wh whose main goal was to polarize um, Americans, right? So they would make a, you know, like black Americans for Trump page and a black Americans for Hillary page and have them fight each other. Um, you know, Muslims for Trump, Muslims for Hillary, like gay Americans for Trump, gay Americans for Hillary. Uh, so like there wasn't necessarily an agenda all the time except just to make people angry, um, which you could say worked quite well. Uh, so that's part of it. But also, Russia in 2016 famously did actually want Trump to get did want to get Trump elected because he was very um, friendly towards them, right? So it would make sense. Obviously, they would want him to be president. Um, so yeah, this this uh, uh, social media interference is a really really big deal. Uh, just the most famous example is from is Russia in 2016. There could be other countries, maybe smaller examples or well, well less well known examples. And definitely there could be a lot of interference that the public just doesn't know about. Um, China would be the second group who could have similar propaganda campaigns. However, they are less sophisticated than Russia. So when you see Chinese, uh, the, they're called Wu Mao, which is, uh, yeah, the Wu Mao, are the 50 cent army. It's like just the same thing, like Chinese people who are presumably hired by the CCP in order to spread Chinese propaganda online. So you go to a YouTube video about China and underneath there's a bunch of pro-China comments um, from Chinese people, uh, you know, no, mostly new accounts. They have, you know, zero subscribers. They just signed up. They have a picture of uh, Xi Jinping. And um, yeah, like, yeah, it's essentially propaganda. The thing is, it's kind of obvious, right? It's kind of, it doesn't really trick anyone. Whereas Russia, they do, they're good, they're good at what they do, right? Uh, it doesn't mean China doesn't do it. They're just less good at it. Um, but China's really good at some other things, right? Obviously, um, hacking and their, their cyber espionage is um, incredible. Uh, they also have TikTok, which is um, amazing. So uh, Russia has a big social media site, VK, but Americans don't use it. TikTok, on their other hand, has like an insane amount of users in America and everywhere in the world, to be fair. Um, and they work to do... Uh, they, so they, they collect data, right? They collect data from you, and there's um, pretty good evidence that TikTok is uniquely um, good or bad at spying on you, at, at collecting information from your phone, uh, obviously location data, pictures, but also accessing other apps and um, a lot of kind of background code that people can't really look at. We don't really know what it's doing on your phone, uh, but probably nothing good. And this could be used for many things, including espionage, spying, but also for blackmail. So they find out uh, something about your messages or interactions on Facebook, on, on TikTok, and they could potentially use this for blackmail. Or if they're hacking into other areas of your phone, I mean, the, the possibilities are truly endless. Um, so other ways, social media could be really bad for democracy, for democratic values, uh, for American um, security, if you could link that to democratic values somehow. Potential rebuttals. Rebuttals for foreign interference. Hmm, we're not going to non-unique this. So actually, we could non-unique this, right? That uh, countries have been interfering in uh, U.S. in elections, spreading propaganda for ever, right? Not just from social media. Uh, but more importantly, for, for the 2016 uh, Russian interference example, let's go for that. Let's try to no impact that. Like, So here's the thought. It's like, yes, we know that Trump that Russia interfered in the election. We know they wanted Trump to win. We know this is true. The question is, did they succeed? We know that he got elected. Is this because of Russia or is this not because of Russia? We don't have the data on that. We do not know. We do know that there were many other factors that probably contributed to his election. Um, the Our electoral college system, for example, worked handily in his favor. 
Um, Hillary was widely hated by many people. Trump was extremely charismatic and tapped into a large uh, population of like former non-voters. Uh, so was it Russia that got him elected this? We, we, we cannot know this answer. Um, and more importantly, there's no interference happening anymore. So this was a famous thing that happened on Facebook in 2016. Uh, Facebook stopped it afterwards. And the, the U.S. government and social media sites were very intent on making sure it didn't happen again. And so they took down um, many, many, many uh, Russian accounts. They made political ads transparent. They changed their terms and policy, made it harder to sign up, especially with fake accounts. Uh, so there's no interference happening anymore. And actually, we were very much distracted, if you know about the, the solar winds hack. Russia now has access to like a huge amount of US networks and computers. Um, I don't know what the status of this is, but I don't think that will change anytime soon. I think they indefinitely have access to our a lot of our important networks. Um, and that's because we were, uh, people say we, we kind of haven't been uh, looking for it. Like we were very, very intent on making sure there was no uh, voting interference in 2020, right? We, we really have all but fixed this problem. Um, whereas we have other problems maybe in the world of tech that we need to focus on, but this doesn't really relate directly to democratic values. All right, forward interference, that is number one. Number two is bad information, and this comes in many forms. So fake news, obviously. Um, fake news is just much more viral. So if you want to make a uh, story spread, like make a lie, like it's they're more interesting, um, at conspiracy theories as well, also very interesting. So we have like things that cause real world effects. A coronavirus is fake, anti-vaccine, uh, conspiracy theories, some sort of anti-democratic, very kind of cynical populist conspiracy theories um, like QAnon. So QAnon is, um, I, don't, I don't need to really read about them, but their thing is like, um, though it's kind of Illuminati uh, related, sort of like the world is controlled by you know, a small cabal of uh, elite baby-eating pedophile Jews, and Trump is the only one who can step in and save us from their evil ways, something like this. Um, a lot of conspiracy theories that really make people, like, very angry, very polarized, um, and I don't know, it makes people sound dumb, I guess. Uh, now, there's other conspiracy theories, of course, like, um, you know, Flat Earth, you know, or we didn't land on the moon or something, where... You know, I it, it, maybe it's not true, but I don't know. I don't know if you believe the Earth is flat. I don't know if your life is really any different, except I mean, you sound dumb, obviously, but I don't think it changes. Whereas if it, if you're anti-vaccine, like your life is going to be different, right? You're going to like potentially die. So, um, propaganda, of course, this is once again coming from other countries. So this is like intentionally spreading uh, lies or falsehoods. Uh, in order to change the American uh, sentiment, the, the, the thoughts of American people. So a lot of different kinds of fake or false information on social media. Some potential rebuttals. Number one is an indicator of fake speech. Of I'm sorry, of free speech. So free speech means people can say what they want. It doesn't mean people can only say the truth. It doesn't mean people can only say what you want them to say. Uh, or they can only say things that fit the established narrative. No, free speech means you can say what you want. That's what it means. And where is the line crossed? Where does free speech become, let's say, illegal? It's where uh, you're going to cause some kind of harm or violence, right? So if you make a threat, that's not legal. Um, if you encourage or incite violence, that's not legal. Um, but if you just say something that people disagree with, that's not illegal. So yeah, the fact that there are conspiracy theories out there indicates that free speech is in the works, and that is um, a great thing for social media. Second potential rebuttal uh, is that alternate news stories are not always fake. There are many, many true conspiracy theories, right? So a conspiracy theory is just, it's a theory that the government is hiding something from people. Does the government hide things from people? Of course they do, all the time. So there are many, many, and then if people get wind of some of those things that perhaps the government is hiding from us. This is called a conspiracy theory. Now, the thing is, because it's not public information, you can make anything up and, you know, say the government's hiding it. And how do we, how, I mean, why don't we know about it? Well, the government's hiding it from us, right? That's why they, uh, you know, are breeding 
giant guinea pigs for the great World War IV in cellars under the White House, right? How, why don't we know about the guinea pigs? We don't have any tr proof. Well, it's, con it's a conspiracy. They're hiding it. Um, so I think, uh, like, uh, vaccine skepticism is a really good example where, like, um, so there, there is a lot of vaccine skepticism, right? Like, um, you know, I mean, on, on the extreme end, like, they're injecting nanobots into you, which would be badass, but it's unfortunately not true. Um, uh, but there are some legitimate concerns about the vaccine, right? And this is kind of not in the established narrative. It's not sort of allowed to be said in a lot of sort of uh, networks. Like, Joe Rogan recently got in uh, media trouble for saying that young people don't need to get the vaccine that if you're like healthy you don't have anything to worry about and statistically that is actually true right um and in terms of the vets go, go get the vaccine for sure i i don't think anyone's saying don't get the vaccine but the fact is it is like kind of an experimental gene therapy that we're um you know trotting out for the whole world now uh will it go well very likely, very likely, it will all go very well, right? Um, I mean, we'll we'll see, right? But um, should you get the vaccine? Almost certainly. There are very, very cute few cases where you should not go get the vaccine. You should definitely get the vaccine. Um, but we, it's sort of like if people are not allowed to talk about the fact that, that this is a new experimental gene therapy that we don't know the implications of, that is actually true. That is actually real life. Um, so, Sorry about my rent. The point here is uh, alternate news can just be discussions of things, right? And um, to say that they're conspiracy theories or just always fake, um, you know, sort of like ideas should fight for each other, with each other, right? Good ideas should be put out there. Bad ideas should be out there. People should determine for themselves what is true and what is not true. Um, and so having alternate n news or kind of non-mainstream opinions, that is the beauty of social media. That's not a bug. That's a feature. That's beautiful. All right, so that is bad info. Uh, next, polarization and radicalization. So I said foreign interference was the most important argument. That might not be true. This one might not, might be true. Um, I think this one is just, um, it's so big and so important and so hard for me to wrap my mind around completely. Uh, but it, it might be really, really important. Um, so populism is... Uh, a kind of political movement that's spreading out the world around the world. Populism just means, um, you know, it, you, it's kind of kind of the rights of the people come first. The rights of the elite and the government are should be secondary, uh, or, or not not quite like this. But the, the common people are being oppressed or repressed somehow by by the elites, by the government, and so uh, populism tries to tap into that sort of discontent with the system as is. Um, and we see this uh, growth of populism, especially on the extremes of the political spectrum. So we have growth both in the far right and the far left. So like extreme far right things would be, um, yeah, a lot of these conspiracy theories, uh, white nationalists, people who are racist and or people who have like extreme um, traditional or conservative values, people who want America to uh, quote unquote return to some kind of quote unquote traditional values. Um, but also the far left, so like really extreme uh, woke culture who's trying to, um, you know, tear down all of the institutions who believes um, in some way that like all of our systems are corrupted, that society needs to be burned to the ground and rebuilt in kind of their image. So uh, both sides are very, there's kind of the, both these very radical sides that are growing. And what are we losing is the kind of like, uh, middle ground, right? The moderate middle ground that's not really radical in any way who, but who kind of like understands that like our systems in America work like, or in the world, I should say, but especially also in America, they work really, really well, all things and the alternatives considered. But at the same time, they've got a lot of problems and we need to work on reforming them very hard. Like that would be kind of the moderate view, right? Um, uh, and perhaps we're losing that, right? And so this can re result in rad radicalization. What's the difference between being like having like socialist ideas of being radical between having traditional ideas and being radical? I would say one of the lines is where you start to have like real life violence. So if you're like, go and, and we see this on the far right uh, more, I would think. 
uh, but to, to, to a smaller degree on the far left, right? Uh, so on the far right, like white supremacists, um, uh, there is, a, I think, a large number of like, kind of white supremacists, like mass shooters. Um, these would be like radical far right, and then far left. You know, there's pe been people who like try to go hunt down like Trump supporters and shoot them. So this would be kind of radical people. There's also just like non-politically motivated crazy people. Keep in mind. But um, so yeah, so so we we're having this radicalization. That's kind of the consequence of being in echo chambers on the. On social media, so I didn't put this word in echo chambers or bubbles, but it's actually a really important idea, uh, right? That when you go on social media, it shows you what you want to see, right? And it, uh, especially YouTube has been, has been famous for, um, show so for suggesting videos to you that are more extreme than the things that you just watched, right? So in other words, if you watch, uh, um, uh, you know, it knows you're a, a mother and are interested in children's health, it'll show you some like anti-vaccine. Um, some anti-vaccine things because this relates to children's health in some way. People have some questions about it. Mothers are worried. And then, you know, you keep watching and, uh, you know, two months and thousands of hours of YouTube later, you're, you know, once again, believe that the world is run by baby eating Jews and Trump can save you from it. Uh, so social media helps to radicalize people. Social media helps to polarize people. Um, yeah. All right. And that has a lot of implications that, um, uh, once again, I wish I, I had a more authoritative way to tell you about them, but um, I know my limits, and I, I would say I, I, I can't quite wrap my head around um, this issue of radicalization and polarization and what the implications are, but I think the implications are uh, big, very big, perhaps very, very big. Uh, all right, what are some potential rebuttals to these arguments? Boop -a -doop. All right, non-unique it as always. So fake news and conspiracy theories have been around forever. Yeah, just look up fake news or conspiracy theories from 100 years ago. Apparently, I, I can't confirm this, but I've heard that during the Spanish flu epidemic at the turn of the century, um, you know, 100 years ago, there was also like anti-mask, anti-maskers and like anti-vaccine people. So I've heard. Um, also, polarization. So if they if if a team claims that polarization is an all-time high, it is very high right now. That is true. Polarization is very high and it's the highest it's been. Um, I, I, I don't know the number. I know the Gilded Age, which is the example I thought of, was more than 100 years ago. So I don't want to say polarization is at a 100-year all-time high, but it, it is high. It is high. Gilded Age, the period between the Civil War and the turn of the century, a lot of social change and a lot of resistance to social change at the same time. Clearly, the Civil War, obviously, people were pretty polarized. Still, to this day, America's most bloody war uh, far more deaths than World War II in terms of American lives lost. Uh, so polarization is not an all-time high. If someone makes that claim, like, no. If they say the highest in 50 years, highest in 100 years, I don't know. They might be right. Um, power. So here's the, yeah, the last argument that I, I, I can't say is a very solid argument. I don't have it thought out very well, but I think it's important. Um, tech, uh, social media giants are hugely powerful and their leaders are extremely powerful and that's a problem because they're not elected and they're not subject to laws that typically govern extremely powerful uh, systems of power in the US ie government right government is subject to one rule one set of rules companies are subject to other sets of rules right uh, but to have so much power in the hands of so few people and just a couple platforms that have such extreme power uh, there's something dangerous about that right especially when they're not elected. Um, so Facebook is more powerful than the government. Uh, one example is with Australia. Um, Australia, I don't know the year, was thinking of proposing a law so that Facebook would have to pay news publishers because Facebook makes a lot of money from people using Facebook and they publish a lot of news on it. So the Australian government was thinking, hey, you know, you need to reimburse these people for all the make money you're making off of their content that's free to you. And Facebook was like, okay, uh, no, um, news is now banned in Australia on Facebook. They just shut it down. Um, millions of Australian Facebook users who use Facebook for news, amongst other things, were understandably very angry. And they were angry enough that Australia decided not to change the law. So Facebook versus Australia, Facebook wins. And uh, having an organization that's this powerful is just concentrates too much power, too few hands. 
um, potential rebuttals for the extreme power of social media organizations. Um, so many big companies accrue a lot of power through providing value to Americans. So uh, Amazon is extremely powerful because they provide a lot of value. Walmart has been extremely powerful because they provide a lot of value. Um, the, you know, the Walton family or in industrial giants, right? So the Carnegie's, right? Or the Rockefellers, they provided incredible value. They built America, they gained success, and that's how they gain power, right? In our system in America, essentially, you gain power through, you know, it, roughly a meritocracy, right? So if you provide a ton of value, the, the market rewards you with success. Obviously, it's not just that simple, Obviously, there's some caveats to that, but in essence, don't complain about people who have gained great power through changing the world for the better. We should be celebrating celebrating their success uh, because it means that our world is a better place now, right? They have earned and gained that power legitimately. Uh, but that's a little bit beside the point because actually uh, go the government is much more powerful than social media. So. Uh, if the government wants to execute someone, they can. If they want to invade a country, they can. If they want to pass a new law, they can. In fact, all of their laws are ultimately enforced, can be enforced with violence, right? So, uh, yeah, most, most laws, if you don't follow them, there's some point at which your freedom uh, will be taken away. They can put you in jail, right? <laughs> Facebook can't put you in jail. Uh, so the government is much more powerful than um, yeah, these organizations, and making that comparison is uh, not right. It's a little bit cynical and perhaps even dangerous. All right, that's all I got for you. Uh, enjoy learning about the national topic. I really like this one. Like I said, I think this will be... I've actually already been teaching it for a little bit. Um, it's been fun. I like it. I'm excited to continue teaching it. Uh, as always, we have uh, our brief and some analytical rebuttals and some Kahoot quizzes, and I think I'll make a gim kit as well. We have this all at debatetrack.com, so uh, go there and please enjoy. Um, I will see you in uh, September. In the meantime, have a, a beautiful summer. Um, be good to each other. Love each other. Hug the people you love. And uh, stay safe, stay happy, stay healthy. And um, oh, over the summer, I believe we will be releasing a public forum course. So if you want to learn all about public forum from A to Z in one place, uh, this will certainly be the place to do it. I think this will be the only full PF course available online. Uh, so excited to release it. Um, I think a good alternative to camps in terms of price, in terms of um, accessibility for everyone, in terms of traveling, um, also just in terms of completeness, because I think most camps are a bit haphazard, uh, good teachers, but the curriculum seems to be lacking. So this will fix a lot of the issues that our camp system um, has so far with debate. Although, admittedly, it will be a lot less fun and exciting going to a camp than going to a camp. So I think camps will always have the monopoly on having a good time. Um, love you guys. Bye-bye.